Hello again everybody, Mike McConville here, Stratford, Ontario, Canada for String Tech Workstations. For those of you who have been following this channel, you'll recognize this headstock. I just recently refurbished a 1966 Melody Maker. So this is a new Melody Maker actually, VOS, vintage on spec, single pickup. It's got this sort of matte black finish and of course a much more sophisticated bridge. So here's a view of the neck. You can see there's a pretty good swoop there. I have not touched this guitar yet. It just came in. This will of course be getting a compensated nut. And we'll give you play by play as always. Cheers. <laughs> what we have here for neck relief, we've got about 40 thou. Actually it's a little bit more than 40 thou. Yeah, this has got a major swoop in it. Not a big deal. We'll tighten the truss rod, as everyone knows. This will be set up for 11 to 49 at concert pitch. Well, as you can see, the engineering for this bridge is definitely pretty fancy stuff when you think of the original 66 Melody Maker bridge that you saw in that other video. Lots of adjustment on each string all the way across as opposed to the sculpted line across the crown that we were limited to with the original 66 uh, Melody Maker in that other video. So this is a much better idea, all kinds of adjustability. You do have the set screws on the back that allow you to move the entire bridge forward or back and then you have the travel on each of the saddles. So, well, you know something? I'm always happy to give credit where credit is due. I've got a one thou feeler gauge here and this one's about as close to perfect as you can possibly get. Now these frets need to be buffed and polished but the actual lay of the frets is pretty phenomenal actually. This is the best one I've seen yet. Uh, it looks so. like they're finally getting some operators trained properly. So this CNC job is perfect. That's the first one I've seen that's that accurate. Oh, the combination of good operator, good machine, we got good results. It looks, it looks like that wear mark is probably just from hanging in a guitar hook. Yeah, same deal on this side. There's no other place on the guitar where it's worn like that. Here's a treat for all the newcomers to the channel. For the regular subscribers, you've seen me do this before. Because, because this is a VOS vintage on spec, we know that that nut actually goes below the paint line here. So I'm going to scribe that. Even though it's flat lacquer, you still want to be careful of it chipping. We'll do the same on both sides. We're going to come just a little bit below the paint line. This is our first cut with a 10 thou kerf. So the blade is 10 thou thickness. Follow that up now with our second blade which is 22 thou thickness. And we followed that up with a 30 thou thickness kerf. And finally we end up with a 58 thou kerf. And now we're going to get ready to heat that nut and extract it. We've gone down as far as we're going to go with a saw kerf. Because I want to show you the detail on this. We've got two protective tongue depressors that confine the saw blade to the nut itself. Zero chance of scoring the fingerboard, zero chance of scoring the headstock. The headstock itself will flex up and pinch into the nut. So this is a big part of the structural integrity of the Gibson headstocks. After you finish, if that nut is in there loosely, that's enough to encourage the headstock to break. Just wanted to point that out. Okay, I've got my timer set. We're gonna heat this up. Four minutes. Okay, we're going to score across the leading edge of that nut while that lacquer has been warmed. All the way across. Just want to kind of break that glue joint. Okay, it looks like this one's coming out like an impacted tooth as well. And that definitely happens. So I'm going to tap this forward. Yeah, this one's not going to cooperate with this. It looks like it's coming out in pieces. That's okay, nothing wrong with that. We're still right on the glue line. We're going to reinstall those protective pieces. Here's our bird's eye view of what we've got so far. I'm going to need to score down this the center mass of what's left of that nut. Reheat it and ease it out nice and gently. This is a huge opportunity for both my students 
and my subscribers that do this type of work this is the worst case scenario nut where it breaks off like that comes out in pieces but if you look closely we are right on the glue joint now we'll reheat again for another four minutes so we're going to start with the end of the fingerboard first to get that off just tap that very lightly then the, there we go yeah see this is all super glued in so they don't make it easy for you well I'm liking that that came out super clean now we're just left with that uh, little bit of residue the end grain of the fingerboard so we're just kind of cleaning that up uh, another tip is you always work from the outside in you don't want to push the chisel through and risk breaking off any paint on the outside edge so always work from the outside of the slot towards the center and that's our aerial view that's our finished product so as you can see there's no lumber there we came out right on the glue line now we'll get ready to make our compensated nut blank so up to this point in the setup of this uh, melody maker we've gone through a bunch of different operations I have purposely not cleaned up anything so you can see what we end up with there's just like a cluster bomb of tools and s string cutoffs and razor saws and hammers and dowels and lights and and screwdrivers kind of heaped up on the bench I'm not encouraging you to heap up tools on your bench but one of the huge advantages of the tech deck is the instrument as you can see is elevated away from all of that stuff on the bench so the yeah. entire instrument along its length width and depth is supported while all that cluster bomb of tools falls to the wayside you know it's just a logical design to reduce the whoops factor incidentally that carton in the background that one's going to uh, Laurent in uh, California that's uh, a Tech Deck Elite like the one you see here and he's going for the whole package neck surgery jig and a bunch of goodies got a good press fit on that nut blank just to see the sort of cross-sectional view so you can see how much forgiveness we're allowing on both sides of that nut especially a compensated nut but just even a normal nut I cut it a little too long on both sides you can always shift it ever so slightly right at the very end uh, to get those strings to line up perfectly so this is essentially how I set up the guitar when I'm filing out the compensated nut I like to have the headstock almost at neck level I can eye down the fingerboard as I'm filing and I get a perfect bird's eye view of the strings now I am doing this without a guard for you guys that are doing this for the first time you can put some type of guard over top of the face of the headstock as you're getting your feet wet with this type of work to make your job quicker safer easier faster so I like to go all the way across once first uh, so I'm not bringing the strings to their final depth. Making sure as I go across that first time that the outside diameter of one string is the same distance to the outside diameter of its adjacent string. Now I do kind of coax the string towards the post where it's going to end up. Now once I get this spacing right and it's looking pretty good the way it is right now but once that's accomplished once you've got the perfect spacing string to string then I do the final depth of the slot and that's determined by two things it's, it's got to be close enough obviously that it doesn't buzz on the first fret but another consideration, a very, very important one, is the amount of pressure that you exert to push the string down to, to create that note, in this case C, uh, you need to check that on the tuner. If that note is sharp, that means you can file that a little bit more until the open B string and the fretted C note are both perfectly in tune. Now all of the final values of the compensated nut are going to be cut once all of these other values are determined. I haven't glued the nut in yet because I still need to cut the final values for this gauge of string which is uh, 1149 
at concert pitch. So I'm just going to remove that. Now nut. that the height and all the compensation values have been cut in the nut, and only now do we trim that outside edge. So the very last thing we do is flush those outside edges to nice and clean and even with the outside of the fingerboard. Okay, I've got those 11 to 49 strings on. And a couple of things I wanted to point out about this bridge. This is a Tone Pro bridge. It's a much higher level of engineering than the original sculpted bridge that you saw in that uh, original 1966 I just finished. There's several things that are quite different about this bridge. I'm going to point them out. So first of all, you can see that the head of that lug is an independent piece. So that just threads into the shaft. Now what's nice about this, if you think about that other video, I had gone to all that trouble on the original bridge to make up a couple of shims to get a good solid press fit. With this bridge, none of that is necessary. I put masking tape on there and that allows me to get a good sort of snug fit in that without damaging the actual face of the top of the bolt. And Everyone knows how many times you see the top of these posts are just butchered because someone used a, a screwdriver that was too small and marred the nice clean chrome slot. Anyway, so there you go. There's a trick. In this case it's a square, but something thick enough that fills that slot completely so that when you tighten it down you don't break off those chrome along the edges. Okay, next tip for setting up the intonation. We have adjustment at this set screw here on the post and a set screw on the opposite side. So the most logical way to get started is adjust it so that that sixth string is just ahead a little bit and you can see that sort of step pattern from the from the E to the A to the D sort of steps forward and then the G string same thing it goes steps back a little bit and then it goes to the B string and the high E string so once you get the saddle set up in that orientation then you adjust the two outside lug set screws and you line up the intonation for this string and for this string. The reason we do it in that order, that will leave enough adjustment in the middle four for you to be able to set the intonation up for any gauge, any string, any tuning. Cheers. Just to get our bearings sort of rough start, we play the open string and we fret the 12 fret note and those two notes are basically in tune with the saddle in this position and the set screw in that position. Same deal on the other side with the first string, open string and fretted 12 fret as everyone does. That is just the beginning as far as setting up the intonation. There are a couple of more very minute details that need to be pointed out with this bridge. There's not a lot of bearing surface on the tip of those saddles. The string, as you know, comes up, wraps around, and it comes up to the focal point on the tip of the saddle, which is the highest point of the saddle. I feel they should have engineered the heights of those saddles, given it another 20, 30 thou height so that there's a little bit more forgiveness in adjustment because you've got to be very careful when filing these out even just like a standard Les Paul bridge as I've mentioned in numerous other videos you have to be careful you can't go filing those out and deepening that slot you need to just open it up so that you get good purchase with the string on the bearing edge of the slot in the center of the saddle but you can't deepen the saddle so here's another cautionary note when the strings come and they wrap around, you have to be careful as you tighten it up. If you don't coax that over and drop it into that slot, uh, you're going to have issues with tuning that string. Right now, the E, A, and D, as I loosen them off, they kind of they popped out of the, their respective slots in the center of the saddle. I'm going to tune this up now without adjusting this. Okay, I've tuned these strings up. Now I wanted to bring you in close so you can see because this is an issue. Your guitar will not tune if this happens. I cut a center slot in there very, very shallow, just deep enough for half the diameter of the string. But right now when I tuned it up, if you're not paying attention, and this is what I'm pointing out, I'm pointing this out for the customer as well, you have to make sure that if it's not in the slot, you need to push it over there we go until it indexes that slot this one too is not in the slot we've got to bring it over ah there we go 
this one kind of found its place in the slot when I tightened it up. But you do have to check all of the strings all the way across to make sure they're each in their respective nicks in the saddle to make sure that your intonation is stabilized. And that's kind of final call on this one. It's basically done. Now that we're finally on the home stretch with this, we'll put just a little touch of medium strength Loctite, which is a liquid nylon that you kind of put on the threads. It coaxes those saddles to stay in place. You could, if you wanted, you could still adjust this. This is a medium strength uh, Loctite. This is set up for 11 to 49 at concert pitch. This should never need to be adjusted. It's a done deal. It's perfectly in tune. Another reason I put that Loctite on there, when you turn that adjustment screw, you give it two or three rotations and nothing happens. It's only after two or three rotations that the thing actually starts to move. So this is another reason to put that Loctite in there, because if they move like 10 thou, it makes a difference between your guitar being in tune or not. We just take a little carnauba wax and just kind of brush it across those slots. I know that there's all kinds of stuff out there that claims to be the, you know, the final word, you know, for lubricating these nut slots, but uh, this is like a Minwax paste finishing wax. It's essentially like the old floor wax that uh, used to be around when people waxed their floors. I remember my mom, you know, when we were kids, you know, getting out the, the buffer and, you know, buffing all the floors you know, twice a week with the sort of double circular buffer. I don't know if anyone else is old enough to remember that stuff, but I remember it as a kid. Those slots are now lubricated. Now we can tune this up for the final time. Okay, now that this guitar is completely behaving itself, I thought it'd be neat to do something a little bit different. So we talked about the diatonic tenths in several different videos. <laughs> tenths on the guitars. It's a pretty wide interval and essentially what we're doing is we're orchestrating on the guitar. So if we assign a voice, if this is the bass voice and this is the soprano voice, then we can kind of play with that and have, you know, the bass voice sustain while the soprano voice moves. You get this kind of a thing. thing would be you could have a descending bass voice and a sustaining soprano so and that would sound like this you can also leap across strings harmonic mechanisms between the first string and the fourth string. So that's our n number one set. And then between the second and fifth string, we'll call that the number two set. And then between the third and the sixth string, we could call that the number three set for the sake of simplicity. So we could go... So at any time, you can kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent with either of those wide intervals and start to orchestrate. So anyway, you get the idea. So. seen me do before is actually add that inner voice so now we could have you know for lack of a better term bass uh, alto and soprano and so what I'm doing here with these three voices uh, I'm having the middle voice move 
and the two outside voices remain stationary. That would sound like this. of either E minor or G major, your choice, however you want to hear it. We'll start with the two outside voices and have the middle voice move now. On the bass string sound like this. Same thing on the middle strings of each. Top strings sound like this. Well, you can get some pretty interesting exploratory compositional things happening by utilizing that wide interval of a tenth in an orchestral sense. Okay, so what we're doing here now is we're sort of jumping from the bass group to the middle group. Have fun with that. So this guitar is definitely perfectly regulated. Cheers.